United Kingdom, we are very happy that you accept our invitation in this webinar of uh, human rights, women human rights. Uh, um, we are very happy you are the third in this webinar that has been organized by the uh, University Program Studies of Africa and Asia. And well, we are we are going to to I'm going to pass the microphone to Anelena. Anelena, please. Yes, of course. Thank you, uh, Alicia. It's a pleasure to, to greet everybody from uh, UNAM UK, the, the offices of uh, the National Autonomous University of Mexico in the United Kingdom. And it is a great honor for me to introduce Professor Diane Elson. I will tell you a little bit about her. We are really very honored to, to have you with us. She is uh, Emeritus Professor of Sociology from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. And she's a former chair of the UK Women's Budget Group. She's also a member of the UN Committee for Development Policy, advisor to UN and, and a former vice president of the International Association of Feminist Economists. She has published, published widely on gender equality and e economic policy. She was awarded the 2016 Leon TF Prize for Advancing Frontiers of, of Economic Thought by the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University and the International Book Prize, Japan Society for Political Economy in 2018. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, welcome, and we are really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sad that at the moment I cannot travel to be with you in Mexico. I visited UNAM at least twice before, but who knows whether it will be possible again. So it's good to be able to have this contact via this webinar. Uh, so I think if my slides will start, yes. So um, my topic is creating caring economies in post-COVID times. Next slide, please. COVID and care. I think we know that COVID is intensified and made visible needs for care. Healthcare, childcare, especially when the schools are closed, care for people with disabilities, care for frail elderly people, care for people who have to quarantine. And care work has become recognized as essential work but it remains underpaid or unpaid. There are paid care workers employed by private companies, paid care workers employed by public sector organizations, paid domestic workers, but also unpaid carers in families and unpaid volunteers in the community. And there are many obstacles to good quality care which have been intensified by COVID. Lack of time, as people try to manage caring alongside their paid work, lack of money, uh, the uh, paid carers are not paid enough. Um, certainly in the UK, turnover in paid care for the frail elderly people is very high. People don't stay in the job, they leave because the pay is so low. There are inequalities of gender, race and class, both in the provision of care and in the receipt of care. And I think we live, certainly in the UK, and I think many other countries too, in a careless economy that prioritizes short-run financial gains and depletes human lives and natural resources, rather than an economy that prioritizes care for people and care for the environment. Next slide, please. So can we do better in post-COVID times as we, we start to think, hopefully, about post-COVID times? Let me share with you the findings of the Commission on a Gender Equal Economy that was set up by the UK Women's Budget Group. We began work in 2019, before COVID. We reported in October 2020 when we were about to go into our second lockdown in the UK. We concluded that we cannot achieve a gender equal economy without addressing well-being and sustainability. And we argued that a caring economy would meet all three criteria. It would be gender equal, it would 
focus on human well-being and it would focus on environmental sustainability. 2021 provides, I think, opportunities to argue for a care-led recovery. And I'm not proposing a recipe for everybody to follow, but I hope the ideas that we developed in this commission will stimulate further debate. And I look forward to hearing from you about how applicable any of these ideas are to other countries. Next slide, please. So just briefly, this is, this is the commission. It was 17 independent commissioners from civil society organizations academics, business, trade unions, and journalists. We, we called for submissions of evidence. We commissioned expert briefing papers. We had meetings in the four nations of the UK. We were very concerned not to be just English and not to be just London based, but to recognize there are four nations in the UK, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, as well as England. And we adopted an intersectional approach in our analysis and in the composition of our commission. Next slide, please. So that, just to remind you, is, is a, a, our vision of a caring economy that we came to throughout our discussions over 18 months. Gender equality, sustainability, and well-being, and where they intersect a caring economy. Next slide. Let me give you a concrete example. We had the vision, now let's have something concrete to, to exemplify this. A uh, good exemplification is investment in public care services. These could be health services, they could be care for children, they could be a care for people with disabilities and frail elderly people. This improves well-being as well as meeting people's care needs it improves gender equality because it relieves the unpaid care burden that's disproportionately carried out by women. And actually, it's also sustainable because investing in care is three times less polluting per job than the equivalent investment in the construction industry. So we looked at some particular numbers about investment in the, the social care sector, not health care, not childcare, but care for frail elderly people and people with disabilities. And we found that if we invested 1% of UK GDP in social care, it would create 2.7 times, times as many jobs in the economy overall as the equivalent investment in construction. 6.3 times as many jobs for women and 1.1 times as many jobs for men. Not surprising, it's a lot more jobs for women than for men because as things are at the moment, employment in the social care sector is disproportionately female, whereas employment in the construction sector is disproportionately male. But it also creates more jobs for men than the equivalent investment in the construction sector. And similar because of this is because of the knock on and multiplier effects uh, onto other industries beyond the care sector. And there are similar findings for other economies. Uh, UN Women commissioned a similar study for Turkey, South Africa and Uruguay which came up with very similar findings. If you invest in public care services, it's very good for creating jobs. It's very good for reducing gender gaps in the labor market. It's good for people's well-being. It improves gender equality and it's less polluting than investment in the construction industry. And we're stressing this because so much of the discussion about recovery it's called build back better and the build tends to be about physical infrastructure, roads, ports, railways, buildings. So investment in public care services exemplifies key thing of what we mean by creating a caring economy, but it's not the only thing. So let's move on to the next slide. So Investing in the public care services is crucial, but a caring economy goes beyond this. A caring economy prioritizes care of one another and the environment. 
It ensures that everyone has time to care as well as time free from care. We found a lot of uh, women that we talked to and men as well said they wanted time free from care responsibilities, but they also wanted enough time to care for their families, for their loved ones, and not be having to spend so much time on paid work that they had no time uh, for this care that they wanted to do for their families. But also a caring economy to enable men to share provision of unpaid care equally with women. So a caring economy is about transforming men's lives as well as women's lives. Next slide, please. So we came up with eight steps to a caring economy. And I'll tell you a little bit about these steps. And uh, uh, I won't be able to go into a great deal of detail on each of the steps, but just give you a little bit of a flavor. So the first thing was to re-envision what we mean by the economy to recognize the unpaid care economy through time use surveys. And I know Mexico has a long history of time use surveys, as does the UK. And indeed, uh, the National Statistics Office uh, does work with these time use surveys. Uh, but my worry is that the economists who make policy in the governments in the UK and Mexico don't use this data. Often they're not even aware of this data existing. So we have to find ways to get them to use this data. And I think one of the ways is to get them to reimagine what they understand by costs, efficiency, and productivity. Just an example from efficiency. Very often there's a big press pressure. We must make the public services more efficient. We must make businesses more efficient. But very often that conceals a transfer of costs from the, the business and the, the businesses and the public sector services, uh, where they show up in the account books, their financial costs, but those costs are then transferred to households, to communities, where they don't show up in anybody's account books, but it's more time, more stress for people in homes and the community. Efforts to increase the efficiency of health services is case in point. If you increase the efficiency of health services, you think by having patients go into hospital early in the morning, they have some day surgery, somebody has to collect them in the evening from the hospital and then look after them for three or four days afterwards. Whereas formerly they might stay in hospital three or four days. That looks very efficient. But then you have to ask, but who's who's looking after them those three or four days that they need looking after when they come out of hospital? And is it people who are having to take time off their paid work in order to provide this unpaid care? Is it really more efficient or is it just a transfer of costs? And I think we also, another dimension of re-envisioning envisioning the economy is to focus on improving well-being and not simply on maximizing economic growth. The big indicator for recovery of our economies that's being prioritized is what's happening to GDP. Is GDP growing again? But GDP growth doesn't necessarily mean an increase in well-being. And I think we have to downplay, not completely abandon, but downplay a focus on GDP and put more focus on measures that will directly look at people's well-being uh, and not only at what is the marketed output that the economy is producing. So that was step one. Step two is invest not just in physical but also in social infrastructure. So invest not only in buildings and equipment but also in workers and change the fiscal rules that hamper this. At the moment, the fiscal rules say that if you build a hospital, that's fine, that's investment. But if you pay the nurses and doctors, that's not investment, that's a cost, that's consumption. And I don't think that makes sense because it's the, it's the health service that you want. A hospital without any doctors or nurses uh, is useless. So we need to change the fiscal rules 
so that spending on the staff of public services, especially the care services, is seen as an investment just as much as providing the buildings for them to work in. We need to provide good pay and conditions um, for, for, uh, for those in the public services and end the outsourcing of public services to the private sector, I think. And in the UK, what we stressed was investment in a universal care service for adults that need social care, which we don't have at the moment. And there's huge unmet needs uh, which have intensified during COVID. So invest not just in physical, but also in social infrastructure if necessary. And it probably is in most countries changing the fiscal rules that hamper this. Next slide, please. Third step, transforming the wor worlds of paid and unpaid work for men as well as for women. There's been a lot of emphasis on getting more women into paid work. There's not been much emphasis on getting more men into unpaid work. And I think for a truly caring economy, we need to do that. We need to make it easier for men to share equally the unpaid care in families. Uh, we need to remove barriers to them doing this, such as very long working hours. So in, the, in our report, we talked about, let's move to a, a normal working week of 30 hours, rather than men being expected to work 40, 50 hours a week, and women have to take part-time work so they can do the care and responsibilities as well. And the part-time work is low paid with low promotion prospects. So can't we have a shorter normal working week and then both men and women could work 30 hours of paid work and then share more equally in the unpaid work of care in the family? And also what about entitlements to paid caring leave? In the UK, we have entitlements to maternity leave and paternity leave, but they're not equal. It's not the same for men and women. And it's also very often you can't have it for other kinds of care, for caring for your frail elderly aunt, for instance, that you might need to take some time from work. So equal legal entitlements to paid caring week is one of the transformations we'd like to see moving more towards the kind of system they have in Iceland, for instance. Fourth, the fourth of our steps was invest in a caring social security system based on dignity and autonomy. The social security system in the UK social assistance and, uh, and also the, the uh, social security that's uh, funded out of deductions from pay has become a very punitive system. It's not seen as something you have as a right. It's uh, uh, the, the conditions to uh, access it have become uh, more and more onerous. Um, uh, you're not treated as if you um, have any dignity. Women don't always get um, social security payments in their own right. It depends on the income of the household that they're in. And one payment is made per household, which creates huge problems uh, for women who want to flee abusive relationships and gives scope for coercive financial control to be exercised by their husbands. So we want to see all that removed. We want to include migrant workers in the social security system in a way that they're not at the moment. We did have a long talk about universal basic income, which I know is being debated around the world. But in the end, we, we couldn't find a consensus on this. So we did not advocate a universal basic income, but I'd be interested to see if other people uh, have ideas on that and, and the role that that might play in a caring economy, both the pros and the, the cons. Next slide, please. Transform the tax system to make it fairer. Uh, so, so I talked about better public services and investing in care services. 
uh, and we can borrow to a certain extent to do that, but we also need to fund some of it through taxation. So transforming, transforming tax systems to make them fairer, I think should be seen as part of a caring economy. And I don't think companies that claim they are socially responsible should be allowed to get away with that claim if they're not paying a fair share of their taxes. So in the UK, we wanted to restore the individual personal income tax. It's not completely individual at the, at the moment and fight for women to have individual taxation has been quite uh, important, but also to tax on earned income at the same rate as earnings, which it's not, to tax wealth, to tax business more effectively than it is at the moment. So a fairer tax system has to be part, we think, of a a caring economy. And then six, we focus fiscal and monetary policy to support a caring economy. So for the UK, we were arguing against restoring restrictive targets for borrowing and deficit reduction. Before COVID, there were restrictive targets in place, a debt to GDP ratio, size of the budget deficit, and fiscal and monetary policy was supposed to focus on these, irrespective of the fact that we had a decade of austerity uh, with complete decimation of the public services and the social security system. Fortunately, I mean, thankfully, in the context of COVID, these restrictive targets were abandoned and the UK is in the fortunate position of being able to abandon them because the UK can borrow in pound sterling, uh, unlike, say, most of the countries in Africa that have to borrow not in their own currency, but in dollars, which is, makes life much more difficult. But when you can borrow in your own currency, it really doesn't make sense to have these restrictive targets uh, for borrowing and deficit reduction. And they have been abandoned, but we're worried they might creep back in. Uh, and yesterday the budget was presented and the chancellor started to talk about this terrible debt burden and how it must be reduced to below 100% of GDP. Um, without really taking into account that at the moment the UK government can borrow whatever it likes. It can borrow 30 year, have 30 year loans at virtually no interest to pay. So don't restore, don't restore restrictive targets if you're, if you're able to do that. And we understand not all countries are. And don't, and, and when you do start to think about how are we going to reduce the debt, and, don't cut spending on public services. Uh, don't make that the thing that you're going to do. Uh, and instead borrow to invest in creating a caring economy. It has all kinds of payoffs, both to, but even to GDP growth, but it has lots of payoffs to human well-being as well. Uh, this last two steps on this last slide. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we were aware in our discussions that we can't create a caring economy in isolation. Every economy is, is linked to other economies in a global system, and it's neither possible nor right to just think of creating a caring economy in one country. So our two other steps were work to develop a trade system that is fair and socially and environmentally sustainable. In the UK, this was a particular concern as we left the EU and started to think about a whole new set of trade uh, negotiations. So one of our recommendations was to ensure that in post-Brexit trade deals, there is no deterioration of standards, either for the UK or for the country with which we're entering into a bilateral deal. I know in Mexico, you've had a lot of experience <laughs> with the, the problems of, of trade deals and how you try to ensure their fair and socially and environmentally sustainable and i think we might be looking to lessons from other countries about the problems and pitfalls of this 
And finally, to work to transform the international economic system. I sit on the UN Committee for Development Policy, so I'm very aware of the inequalities and unfairness of the international economic system, the international financial system. And, and I know that the UK is in a, a privileged position within this, uh, both because of its economic power and also because of its membership of the G7, its position as executive di as a powerful executive director on the IMF and the World Bank, its position in the G20. So uh, we recommended that the UK government should support the the, the setting up of an, the U, an intergovernmental tax body under UN auspices to work on eliminating global tax evasion and avoidance and to support better debt relief for countries in the south. And we will be pressing the UK government to do this in the upcoming uh, G7 meetings, in the upcoming discussions again about will the IMF issue uh, another set of special drawing rights. So we think this is all part of a caring economy uh, to release the constraints to increase the policy space for governments so they are able uh, to create caring economies. And I think the last slide is coming up. So possible, possible discussion questions. I mean, one question is whether the concept of a caring economy is useful for framing discussions about post-COVID recovery. We found it useful in the UK, but it may not be useful in other countries. So I'd be very interested to, to hear what people think about this. Caring economy, care-led recovery, are these ideas uh, that have resonance in other countries? We haven't suggested framing the strategy in terms of degrowth or deglobalization although we did have some discussions of this, but we preferred to say, rather than degrowth, uh, to say, let's downgrade all the attention on growth. Let's upgrade the attention on well-being. But does degrowth, if you advocate degrowth and you're in the UK, maybe that sounds like telling other people they can't have growth when you've already had it. So we didn't frame it in those terms, nor did we frame it in terms of deglobalization, but more in terms of a, a fairer international uh, financial and trading system. But that may seem uh, inappropriate, the, the wrong way. There are people I know who feel passionately about framing things in terms of degrowth and deglobalization. Mm -hmm. We've suggested that unpaid care and domestic work be recognized in policy through reconceptualization of concepts like efficiency, productivity and costs, which economists use all the time in evaluating and designing economic policies. We didn't prioritize adding unpaid care and domestic work to the GDP. And again, that might it, in the UK, we do have a satellite account, as I think you do in Mexico, but we didn't, we didn't uh, recommend that this satellite account should actually be incorporated into the GDP. Since we were already arguing that we wanted to downgrade attention to GDP, that didn't seem like the appropriate way to go, but we wanted to get more purchase on the actual policy decisions that economists frame and help to make and how could we get them to take on board the issue of unpaid care and domestic work in the way, for instance, they plan investments. Is the concept of social infrastructure useful? Why not just say public services? Because after all, when we talk about social infrastructure, we are uh, referring to public services. The reason we chose this way of framing it is because there was so much talk about investment in infrastructure and pictures of politicians 
with hard hats on building sites. And we wanted to claim the notion of infrastructure and the notion of investment for services like care and not only for construction of new railways. How would you redesign men's paid work so they can take an equal share of unpaid care and work? I think the caring economy isn't just about reducing the amount of care that women have to do. It's about equal sharing of care between men and women and about transforming the lives of men, perhaps to make them more like the lives of women, when we've had so much emphasis in the past 40 years longer on making women's lives more like the lives of men. And we did find there was a younger generation of men who were actually quite keen to play a bigger role, for instance, in the, the care of their children. Would you advocate for a universal basic income as part of a caring economy? Which tax reform would you prioritize depending on your, your circumstances? Uh, what are the constraints on your country adopting a less restrict, restrictive fiscal and monetary policy? And are there uh, other specific suggestions for reform of international trade and finance to support a caring economy? Um, I'm aware that all of these might be, might be objections and issues that you might have in mind, but please, anyway, raise any questions that you wish, and I hope that uh, my thoughts about sharing with you the thoughts that we, we've developed in the UK about how to create a caring economy and how to advocate for a care-led recovery uh, might provoke some interesting discussion. Thank you. The microphone. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Diane. It's very interesting because COVID put, uh, has put on the floor the caring economy. And the caring economy is especially one of the new things that feminist economies has done for the economy. Because as we know, uh, the economy science is a monetary economy, but never, never makes uh, the, the working of the use time, not only at home, but of, of other activities. So I, I, it, 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 I have so many questions. I would like to have some comments. Also, Anna Elena is going to have some comments, but um, I think if you want to have a, a, a caring economy, a care economy, as we, we in Mexico and in Spanish is, Economía del Cuidado. Also, uh, it has been using uh, economy of life, economía de la vida. But if you, I think this, this will be the goal to change all the economy. Because if you are going to put fiscal policy and monetary policy around a care economy, you have to change a lot of things. And I'm sure that care economy is not a it doesn't bring you pollution and it also will bring you employment that is one thing that we need to have more employment and it's the economy of life so how can you imagine how can we can imagine how how can we construct a new fiscal and a monetary policy because it is very nice to talk about care economy but be, be, behind that, you need the, the finance. You have to finance all this approach. So that will be one of my um, my preoccupations. But I will give the floor to Anelena also, and then uh, so we can share uh, the ideas. Anelena. Um, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful and very, very suggestive and uh, inspiring talk. I'm not an economist, but still, I think that um, the main problem that I, I perceive is uh, how to make these uh, very 
good ideas into policies. No? And I was wondering what the connection between the UK Women's Budget Group and the British government was and uh, whether that would be an easy transition. It is often the case that within academia, we are um, allowed in a way to explore uh, radical ideas, even things that depart from the things that we are used to, uh, and uh, we never question them. But at the same time, we need to be able to, to connect them to, to real life, uh, to, I mean, um, policy makers in the end. So I think um, one, one of the problems might be, I, I am from a literature department, so um, a linguistic, uh, a way of, of um, formulating these ideas in a way that people do not um, refuse uh, uh, on, a, on an almost uh, instinctual manner, um, saying, no, 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 we, we cannot stop growth. Gro stopping growth is an anathema, no? So how do we, uh, I mean, it is, it, it is fascinating in a way, no? How, because uh, of course I agree with, and uh, uh, I find it also fascinating that you have delucidated all these seven, uh, eight steps, but at the same time, how can we move them forward? Thank you. Should I respond to that now or? Yeah, okay. There's really, really good questions. And I have to say, there are multiple strategies we have to adopt. And the strategies are different in London with the UK government than they are in Cardiff with the Welsh government and in Edinburgh and Glasgow with the Scottish government. Because the governments in Scotland and Wales are much more interested in talking about a caring economy. They've already adopted a well being approach. They've already introduced modifications to the social security system to support those who are providing unpaid care for frail elderly people. They've already have commitments to invest more in childcare and in social care but they don't command the fiscal <laughs> resources and they don't have a central bank at their disposal. So although they're very interested and we have very good dialogue with them, um, they, they are not the ones with the biggest fiscal uh, power, nor do they have monetary power because they, there's no central bank for them. The central bank is for the UK as a whole. So of course, we also try and engage in dialogue uh, with uh, the UK government. That isn't so easy now as it was in the period from 1997 to 2000, uh, uh, 2010, when the Women's Budget Group had regular meetings <coughs> with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, we had seminars with them, we had detailed discussions about various of the policies. We didn't always agree, uh, but there was some shared common ground, and I think we did have some influence on some of the details of the new policies that were introduced. But with the financial crisis and the austerity policies and change in government, that all changed. So now, since 2010, we have not had any interesting discussions with officials at the at the uh, at the ministry of finance the treasury we call it nor with politicians in that department but we do have very productive discussions with parliamentarians with a cross party parliamentary committees um, to which we give evidence. So, for instance, last year I gave, and the year before, I gave evidence to the Parliamentary Select Committee on the Treasury, which uh, examines the budget um, and which has got members of Parliament from across the political spectrum. And in their report, they took notice and they, they referred some of the points I'd made and some of the things the Women's Budget Group was advocating for. Um, similarly, the Parliamentary uh, uh, Committee on uh, uh, Women's Rights and Equalities, we give evidence to them and they have, in their recent report just out a couple of weeks ago, took up and advocated for a lot of the points that we were making. And in two weeks time, I will be giving a talk on, online like this one 
to a network of young government economists who have been con who contacted me and other uh, more heterodox economists, economists who are not part of the conventional wisdom or the mainstream, because these young economists want to broaden their horizons and they want they have this informal discussion group where they want to hear from economists with different perspectives. So I'm going to be talking to them about why we should be having a care-led <laughs> recovery and, and drawing their attention to the data on unpaid um, unpaid work that our national statistical uh, office provides but i don't think any of these young economists really know that it's there or what they could use this data for so i think those are the uh, and of course strategies with the media um on the uh, on the radio on the tv in the newspaper so that you try and change uh, public opinion even if you can't immediately change what the government in London is doing. So I think you sometimes have to have this longer and roundabout strategy and to try and um, couch your arguments in terms that will, will, will have a broader appeal uh, and will say, well, you know, well, actually, some things you've done, well, yeah, that's good, we, we like that, but these other things which you've either done that we don't like or you, you haven't done and you should have done, I think that's the way we try to approach it. So to engage in a dialogue, um, but being aware that that dialogue will make more progress in some political context than in others. Yes, I would like to make another comment, but there is a, a comment of the audience is Adriana Martinez Gonzalez. She said, don't cut spending on public services. That is just the key, I think. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And this is what we'll be saying in our comment on the UK budget, which was yesterday presented to the parliament. And although we will support some of the measures that have been taken to, for instance, extend what we call the furlough scheme, which is the, the, the scheme to um, subsidize the wages of, of those who are employed by businesses that can't open and operate because of the lockdown. So we're very pleased to see that that will be extended, that there will be new support for self-employed people. This is good. But on the other hand, the actual funding for the public services is not being expanded. The care services that I've talked about and the, and the health services, the money for them is not being expanded. And so that we're going to be very critical about. Why, why, why isn't this being expanded? Why isn't this, since these services are so under stress because of COVID and so needed because of COVID, why isn't the government putting more money into these services? Um, even though it's doing some other things which, which we support and approve of, this is a missing piece of the jigsaw. So absolutely agree with you that, but not just the money for public services, because this is also one of the things I learned by looking in more detail at, for instance, how social care is publicly supported in, in the UK. And I think in many countries where um, there's payment made for it by the government, but a lot of that payment goes to private companies the, the care workers are not directly employed by the government. There's not a public care service. The care services are funded by the government, but they're outsourced to private companies. And some of those private companies are big, financialized hedge funds yes. headquartered in tax havens. They're not even small businesses run by a retired nurses. Um, so we've learned that you also have to look in a lot of detail about how is the money being spent and who is it, who is it going to? It's not only arguing for more money for these services, but also arguing for um, it, that money being used in a better way than it is certainly in the UK at the moment. Yes, 
And I think this issue of outsourcing of public services to the private sector and underpaying uh, the, the people who actually provide the services is a, is a problem in quite a lot of countries. Yes, um, there's another comment, but before uh, uh, reading this comment, uh, I think you have, uh, you have said one very important thing. Our economies are, fin the financialization is live with us and we live for the by the finalization process. And this is very important because if, when we see the budget, how it is used, the budget in Mexico, it is impress impressive how the social budget has reduced and it has reduced a lot because we have to pay a high amount of external debt mm -hmm. at around 30, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know if you, I will say it good in English, 30 billion dollars each year because we have a terrible external debt and yes, I yes. it is inc inconceivable how the government hasn't renegotiate that debt especially in these times mm -hmm. so you have reduced a lot so you don't have money to to the health system and also to the education system and this is this is very important so that's why i say that you have to change if you want to have a care economy you have to change especially the fiscal and the monetary policies yes. which which are the core yes. of the economy and sometimes many people that that uh, even the academics and the heterodox academics that worse poverty they think that poverty is like oh they are very sad because there are a lot of poverty but they can concede that you have to change your monetary and fiscal policy so this is this is uh, why we have to continue and continue talking about how we can improve the economy from a gender perspective mm -hmm. and well i will I, I would like to continue talking but i am going to read the other comment it is uh, from just to say alicia i quite agree with you and i at some time you and i will have a more detailed discussion about this reshaping the fiscal and monetary policy yes. especially the monetary policy which is your area of expertise and i agree with you that you need international initiatives on this as well as national initiatives on this yes and we can also uh go, for example all the migration problem you can imagine that diana and then we will talk uh, in another uh, webinar about how the central american women are a, a, a doing uh, are are migrating to the USA and they are passing by Una, by Mexico and then all the American dream yeah. in Mexico is um, how to say is it it is um, it, it is a shame how yeah. the, in Mexico we are killing all the migrants we are violating the human rights of women it is inconceivable but well. The, the, the comment is, thank you, Diane, that to, for the interesting talk. How could we prepare the next generation of women and men to be aware about the care economy and the importance to pay what now is on paid work? Also, do you think the education on these issues should be different for men and for women? Okay. Mm. Very That's good question, very good question. And I think I think there have to be multiple strategies and depending, of course, on, on where you are as well. Um, but certainly, I think um, we in the Women's Budget Group in the UK try to uh, reach out um, to uh, younger feminists, for instance, who might be who who haven't studied economics and who are working on say violence against women and we help them make the links between the issue that they're working on violence against women and the issue of um, unpaid work and the way this is treated in the economy and i know there are groups uh, that are working with young men uh, both in the uk and in many other countries um, that are one of the things they're working on is fatherhood and new ideas about fatherhood and what fatherhood entails. So I think there are many ways we, we should try and do this, both in formal education and in informal education. 
and maybe the start well a, a one good starting point for everybody both men and women is to get them to do a time diary for what did they do yesterday or the previous week where you know when did they get up when did they go to bed what did they do in all of these moments in between getting up and going to bed and just bringing out the differences that usually are uh, between the ways that men and women have spent their time that often uh, is very good for um, getting a discussion going about what are these differences and why are they like that and should they be transformed in some way and can they be transformed in some way because it brings it down to people's everyday experience. Yes, and, and also one, I think it is very important to see also how in the rural areas is this gap of, um, the, the, the gap of uh, between women and men. And the, the problem is in this gap is a public policy that haven't given, for example, water. Yes. It is incredible. Yes. Yes. And um, when when we went to when I was in 2005 in the my, uh, microeconomic gender course at um, Nilufer and in Utah University, there was a group of youth time. I, I just couldn't believe why they have to do that. And at the end, uh, I discovered that time use is very important because time time use. Is, it is related with public policy. And it is not the same that woman that op opens the water at their home, at, but the other woman that has to go for cooking, they have to go one kilometer, two kilometers, many, many, many exactly. kilometers for the water, and then make the cooking, take the children. So that's why public policy are very important because it's a way to change these conditions and sometimes the, the anthropology, the anthropology view, see uh, they um, even our, our colleagues that are an and from the anthropology view, they think it is um, it, it is very normal, it is for, very folkloric, but that is poverty, and that's the the <laughs> it, yes. So it is like well, I, I, it, it is unbelievable because you have to change that that. Uh, the life of those women and especially so they can live more more that's why that that, that they pass away between the 40s and the 50s and and they and this has also to see for example all the people that are um, that has been that are dying in mexico mm -hmm. most of them are people young people between the the 30s and the 50s that are uh, a day a day that they have to work every day. They just even they they even they don't have a computer. Maybe they have an uh, an intelligent phone, but they have to go. And and the problem is that in those people, even the the formal employments in the public sector, they don't have have uh, a, a better nutrition at their at their office because they just get out and they have the tacos and that's why or the torta de pan, pan, tamal and that's why we have a lot of obesity diabetes and hypertension in these people are those are the ones that are uh, passing they are dying very quickly and this is care economy diane this is care care economy is not only taking taking care of the children and of the all people it's a big package that we have to construct and put it in the hands of the parliament. But the problem, I think, even you have a, you have worked a very nice program for care economy, the problem is in the monetary and in the fiscal policy. Well, I, I, I will give the floor to Anelena, please, Anelena, or Diane, if you want to say something, Diane. And so Anelena will close. Please, Diane. Well, I absolutely agree that we need to release the constraints that fiscal and monetary policy is putting on the pursuit of human well-being. Um, I agree with you absolutely that 
and our concept of a caring economy isn't just about the care services, is indeed putting human well-being, which means tackling things like obesity, putting human well-being rather than economic growth. It's not saying we shouldn't pay any attention to economic growth. I know, you know, there are really important reasons why finance ministers have to look at that data, but they shouldn't just be looking at that data, nor central banks. They should be also looking at these indicators of human well-being, of which obesity is a really important one, becoming even more important as we have the latest data that shows that um, deaths from COVID are much worse in countries with high levels of obesity and among obese people. So we really need a caring economy in all dimensions that focuses on human well-being. And there are a lot of obstacles to getting there. And the way that the international financial system operates at the moment is one of the obstacles. But it's making these links between the international, the national, the local, between the macroeconomic policies and the meso microeconomic policies that I think uh, we, we need to work on. Anna, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for such a fascinating talk and uh, so many suggestive ideas. Um, the the care-led recovery, right? I think COVID has opened up opportunities in, in a very terrible, tragic manner, but uh, it is a picture of what we have achieved so far, and I think it's a good opportunity to rethink the way societies function. And uh, in, in the different contexts, we cannot ignore this anymore, I hope. And um, so in that sense, I hope we have reached a, a, a turning point, um, which will hopefully have as a consequence a reconsideration of the things that uh, are un undermining uh, human sustainability, yes. which one of the pillars of sustainability is human society. Uh, if it uh, self destroys, well, there is not much of a chance of doing anything else. So thank you. Thank you so much, Diane, for, for this um, wonderful talk. Um, thank you to Poea, Alicia Giron, as always, is wonderful uh, in the program for the study of Asia and Africa. And thank you to all of you who have been with us in the different channels, whether on Facebook or YouTube. And um, we look forward to getting in touch soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.